listening to the Spectacle Podcast with Garrett Light. <laughs> I mean, you're a big glasses guy, right? I mean, I love them, bro. I yeah. love, like, I brought a few other pairs of things that I like, too. Yeah, I think that this is one of the best ways to accentuate a personality or an outfit that sure. there is, you know? Yeah. I wear a little bit of jewelry, but I would prefer to have, like, yeah. some really cool shades. Yeah, like, you're right. Glasses just are, like, very character -driven. Like, it's the first thing you see, so you can really mm -hmm. change your whole character based on a certain pair of glasses. You can fly under the radar, or you can, like, make a statement. Yeah. And it, even flying under the radar can be your statement, too. That part, too. Yeah. I feel like you've... Uh, like from an early age, obviously struggled with vision, right? Because you wore glasses super young. Anyway, like prescription. No, 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 no not no. at all. My sight is amazing. Okay. So the the glasses claimed me in the movie. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, for sure. Oddly enough, well, the glasses claimed you. Yeah, yeah. Um, oddly enough, I was uh, I was originally reading for the role of Yeah Yeah, okay. and they just kept trying to throw me into squints. And uh, you know, my my mom. And, and management at the time thought that, yeah, yeah, was a better role in the script. And they were like, no, nah, we really want him to read for Squint. So uh, that kind of came about, and I booked that role and then put the glasses on. And, uh, you know, Sandlot was a really cool thing because we shot it chronologically, which doesn't happen in film very often. No, I wouldn't think. And because we did that, all of these characters were able to develop in real time as David Mickey Evans, the writer and, yep. and director, was able to, like, be screaming at us with a bullhorn, say this or try that. Like me and Patrick Renna's roles uh, that played Ham, you know, maybe they weren't as big in the original script and then ended up- but they developed. Developing yeah. over the time, you know? And only because we shot it chronologically was that able to happen right. and for these roles to blossom into what they are, you know? Was that like uh, how David worked? Like, did he do that? I know he did Radio Flyer too. I was a yeah, big- uh, Yeah, so the, the story with him was, you know, he wrote Radio Flyer. Yeah. And then That's he- That's a heavy movie, but very good. Very heavy, yes. But very good. Yeah, I very good. As a kid. And then he started to direct it, and they fired him like two weeks into production. And, as, uh, the direct, as, the, as the director. As the director. And no, left him with nothing else? Um, like he didn't- No, he, he was still a- he, I mean, he wrote it. He still had producer credits. Sure. And he said it was the best thing that ever happened to him in his career because- Interesting. I believe it was Richard Donner, I want to say, that, that directed it after him. So they recast the film. So they went away from his cast, they recast the film, and then he got to sit behind Richard Donner on his project and watch him direct his film. Okay. And I think Sandlot is probably the movie it is because of what he, he had this little, this little turn of direction. And he got to sit behind a director that's a very, very talented director and, uh, and watch him and do this film. Right. And uh, he, he credits, his ability to that to that little moment in life where life pivoted and was probably the end of his world at the moment. Right. You know what I mean? But it it catapulted him into making his masterpiece. Right. And we all got to be a part of that. Yeah. That's like the opposite of Tarantino, right? He won't see true romance because he didn't direct it, but he wrote it and he says yeah. it's like the worst piece of shit or something. <laughs> so I guess those two uh, directors Quentin has a Quentin is a very uh uh I mean, he sees things the way he sees things, yeah. you know. And, yeah. And we've seen that following your heart and your career path can have yeah. can have great results can, as well. Sure. You know? Absolutely. Um, I know. Uh, like I've met Patrick. Is that your? Is that you guys good friends? Yeah, me and Pat are close. We've yeah. done three films together, so yeah. I probably have worked with him more than anybody else. Yep. And our families uh, uh, have been around each other since we were children. So. Yeah. Funny story. I was in. I didn't know him at the time. I was in Vegas, and very rarely will I like say anything to somebody that uh, is famous as the word or, you know, like has affected my life through something, po you know, popular. And uh, I, was, I was, it was late and I was in Vegas and I saw him at like a crab's table. And I think I just like, th what I'll do is I did this to Andre from Outcast once at the airport because I don't put stickers on my car and I never have, but I once had an Outcast sticker on my car because it felt like it was the only thing valuable we're sharing. So anyways, I, I told Andre that story. And then when I saw Patrick, I just said the same thing. I was like, dude, your character like definitely had a significant effect on my life. Like it was great. And I showed my kids that movie at like six and it was like their first like kids movie that had um, humans in it, not, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and they loved it. Yeah. So I was like, man, this thing withholds the test of time. So he appreciated that. And then he actually has like a digital marketing agency, right? Yes, he does. So uh, I know his partner, Brandon, and that, and then we actually officially met in that capacity. That's but cool. He's a great dude. Yeah, he's awesome, man. And uh and like you said, the the thing about Sandlot is is that here we are thirty years later, mm -hmm. 
and the kids still watch it mm -hmm. and the, the parents will watch it with them and the grandparents that's that showed right. it to them. That's and right. It's like creating this legacy. Crazy. Not a lot of movies like that. No, not at all. Especially Few. from that era, which is like, right. you know, there was a lot of cheesy kids sports films. For sure. In, in the 90s. I did I did a few of them, so yeah. I know, you know what I mean? <laughs> and yeah. then, uh, yeah, that's a cool story, actually, is that I, I once again, back to David Mickey Evans, I kind of credit him in this, is that him and Tony Richmond, who was the, the DP on that um, brilliant uh, operator and, and director of photography, but David showed him old Kodak chromatic film, and he said, this is what I want it to look like. And because it's set in 62, right. and it's like this time capsule of Americana that's shot in this weird, like, chromatic look, it kind of just is timeless, and it doesn't really age. You know, you can't tell that it was done in the 90s or if it was done beforehand. Right. And for some reason, you can still sit down and watch it and be like, wow, this is all still very effective. That's great. Yeah, yeah. and it resonates with various generations because it yeah. speaks to, like, their childhood and then ours because it came out at our time and the whole thing. Um, staying on the glasses for a second or getting back to them. Yeah. Um, so you said the glasses made the character or whatever. You said something in that vein. They made they made you. Um, how did that come about? Like a stylist put those on you or you're just wearing them? No, they, I, uh, I guess that you just were a kid that wore glasses and those no, are just yours. No, no, no. So that was the character. And that was what the stylist came up with. And so I've been hunting these glasses down obviously in my adulthood as the, the film's been a, a big deal. I don't actually have the original pair. I think they're in the Louisville Slugger Museum or something at the moment. But, uh, you know, I guess you grow up in LA, you get to see that like, you know, some people get to choose their handles and some people don't, you know? And right. I feel like, you know, Squints kind of chose me and the glasses, I put the glasses on and that became a piece of, of my life, so to speak. And, but if you uh, look up any photo of you, actually, there's tons of photos of you wearing glasses. So like, did that develop into something you realized that you like you love like you love eyewear clearly I mean yeah. you contact you know you want to talk about eyewear you're doing something in the space yeah it's part of yeah. you I think that it just fits and it's organic and obviously like you know what did Jimmy Iovine tell Dre he said what are you gonna do sneakers for you don't know nothing about sneakers he said you need headphones right well if Squints was gonna sell something right it'd be glasses I mean besides cannabis obviously it would be <laughs> <laughs> it would be glasses right sure yeah so. Uh, but I waited on that for a long time. So this project came very organically and it wasn't, I'm not a gimmick guy. It's not like, what, what can I do to make a dollar? Sure. You know what I mean? And I never want to do anything that isn't, isn't collectible or that is, isn't well done. You know what sure, I mean? I want to create art in, yeah. in every capacity of my life. I chase doing, you know, cool things with cool people. Yeah. And, uh, and so this came about naturally and I felt like, okay, finally it's time to, uh, to see this through and and see where it goes. Yeah. I think when I just did a little research on you, it seems like to add to what you're saying is it's like you're focused on doing things that you're passionate about. So when I look at like your self-directed stuff or self-produced, it's like you must like poker, you must like cannabis, you must like glasses. Yeah. And you I don't know if you're a cinephile, but like obviously like hot, like you yeah, love, love film. film. And yeah, you love film. Pop so culture, music. So it's, you know, chasing those Things, cool things, but those are the things, you know, that's subjective, right? Cool. But those are the things that you find interesting. Yeah, definitely. Right on. Um, and you're from, you told me today you're from Texas, but really you're from Reseda. Yeah, I'm from LA. I'm from and the Valley. One of my best friends actually went to school with you. He said, uh, he called it Sutter the Gutter. Yeah, that's is that, right. Is that true? Sutter Middle School. Yeah. Sutter Middle School. Yeah. The, the, what was what was growing up there like? Um, the Valley was pretty rough in the 90s, bro. Yeah. And I mean, it's always had like, People think of it as the suburbs, but the Valley has a very, yep. um, it's played a critical role in the development of the Los Angeles area, right? Yeah, for sure. And and in like the hierarchy of all of these vices and things that have gone on. I mean, obviously the porn industry and all of these things have kind of been front row central to the Valley. And so, you know, all walks of life yep. and uh, and stuff have, have came through there, right? It's the place that everybody leaves from everywhere else to go and live a better life, so to speak, right? Sure. And what they bring with them is is wherever they came from, you know? Right. So it's kind of a melting pot. And, uh, you know, in the 90s, we had the rise of, of gangster rap and hip hop mm -hmm. and of graffiti. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that because of my age, I was at the forefront of the merging of punk rock, hip hop, skateboarding, graffiti culture, and all of these elements that we see as 
as running the fashion industry now, right? Mm -hmm. With the Supremes and, and these people getting appointed to Louis Vuitton and 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 hip hop culture and pop culture and punk and all of these elements Most definitely. becoming high fashion, right? And so I kind of got a front row seat to all of that. And because I lived in the Valley in LA, I had a like a, I could interact and see all of these things in real time as well, right? Because all of these people are in, in this, this area, you know, I'm sure everybody in the entertainment business has lived in the Valley at one time or another for the most part in sure. LA. All the studios are there, right? Yeah. 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 So everybody's kind of around there. So Everybody it was cool, back. man. Sutter was a pretty rough school. Um, it's in Canoga Park. Uh, very blue collar. Right. Um, you know, we were bad kids. Um, but didn't you get this role? Like your fame kind of came before that, right? You know, it's weird though, because it was because of the timing. It's not what we think of as fame today, right? Sh sure. You're so far removed from it. Not you do... fame, but like you were the kid in that movie. Yeah, I was. Yeah. But you were running with a little bit of more of a dangerous group of people. Not I, dangerous. I, I, it wasn't I mean, really dangerous, but it was. Yeah, we were definitely pushing the limitations. Of correct. What was <laughs> correct. What was yeah. Uh, gray and white area. You kind of hope sure. your your kids don't do that. Uh, they won't for sure. No, I know, but you a, that you don't want in time. But correct, yeah, no, don't want that. Bro, not at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, you know, yeah, I was doing film, but I kind of lived two lives. I was That's a I'm Hollywood person, right? You know what I'm yeah. saying? We came into this business by accident through somewhere else and ended up in L.A. and just kind of never left. Did you feel like that that maybe could have been an option for you? Like, I, I guess having not the, in, the the knowledge nor being part of it in any way, like some kids like took the Holly like the Corys or whatever like yeah did it feel tangible for you as a teenager that you like oh shit i could be running like in a hollywood lifestyle on sunset boulevard I, I like in, did I you feel very comfortable and receive you lived in both yeah okay. so i had i have hollywood friends sure and i was around to see and then i had friends from the neighborhood right that were totally different you know i feel like you felt more comfortable in the neighborhood i know i do i, do. I feel more comfortable in i'm the from venice like yeah. i don't i feel more comfortable in that like yeah. that sort of it's not rich but just like that communities yeah makes me nervous Dennis, it's Dennis not has a rich 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 communal history obviously for sure yeah. yeah um yeah i felt more comfortable sure from the neighborhood yeah and around my around my people you know right. i could go and do both but i wasn't a hollywood guy trying to live a hollywood life right I, I, like i got that this is these people are full of shit and this is kind of smoke and mirrors you know kind of yeah not kind of but <laughs> you know, like it really is um and, right. and you know i think it all has Say its place there yeah yeah. yeah, but uh, I appreciate both. Yeah. And I love that I had the opportunity to develop my my life out of both sides of that, you know? Right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this eyewear project. Um, yes, sir. What can you tell me? What, what's going on? Um, I, don't, I don't know. Um, so I did bring the, the samples, but okay. uh, we actually went a little bit different of a way from this. Okay. So... Um, I have a friend uh, that makes custom sneakers. He goes by Ease Kicks. Um, he's very talented. He's a, he's actually a, a, a professional in jiu-jitsu in the jiu-jitsu field. Um, he's a teacher and coach and has a studio. Um, but uh, you know, we met and uh, started working together on a on a pair of sneakers. And uh, he said, "I got a friend from New York. His name's Spencer." And he made this piece of art for you, and he just wants to give it to you, bro. If you, if I can bring him by, and uh, he used some of my cannabis bags, and he like incorporated this thing and made me this dope ass uh, piece that was like drug war veteran, and had my bags in it and stuff that he just creatively thought that was cool, you know? Yeah. And uh, he gave it to me. And Spencer has a company called Stone, and he makes um, these really cool. Uh, I have a pair in the car too. I should have brought them up, but uh, he makes these really cool sunglasses um, that are very uh, just outside the box. It has a totally different look. Um, sure, the, like totally original kind yeah, of shape. Yeah, the, and... the, the frames drop down, so they're kind of a low setting, like okay. like drop down with a big oversized frame with a big arrow on the front, okay. and they're just very artsy and artistic. Sure. And uh, as we were talking, he was like, you know. I've been handcrafting and uh, these out of Italy, and I have a really good understanding of the space now because I've been making these. And you know, would you be interested in doing a squints project, oh, like a, a collab project with me? And I'm like, yeah, I'm super interested. I yeah. know that you do good work and you care about quality, and I know that 
you understand the space and I don't, which is great. Um, I know what I like, not to quote Rick Rubin, but I know yeah. what I like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fair enough. And uh, and so we kind of came up with, and so. So you worked collaboratively with him to develop the design. Yes. But you didn't go to the factory, you didn't take part in the. No, we're just he, now in the process of he doing did, that. Though. Yes, or he's yes. been. Like, yes, he's been, yeah. And he's, uh -huh. working, and he's with... working, he's hand working with the guys in Italy to create these frames. So this was our first concept, in it? which we thought was really cool. Was uh, I oh, said well, I want to do the squints the squints frame yeah so clip. yeah so it's got a magnetic clip this was our first iteration I said I want to do a squints glasses but I want to do them really high end you know sure I want them to feel like something I would want to wear not some cheesy plastic that's not of great quality you know good hardware right. a solid a solid thing you know and uh, five barrel hinge and like real core wire and yeah like exactly oh yeah they're comfortable yeah they're dope so, so these are. That was the beginning of it. It has evolved a little bit. So with the magnetic, he said, I think we can do magnets in them and they can be the squints glasses for anybody that has an optical, you know, an optical need that needs prescription sure. lenses, which these are obviously Ray-Ban with the, with the Wayfarers has made these really popular. They're I don't different. like Wayfarers. They are different. Wayfarer. Yeah. They're also not quite the squints glasses. Um, they're pretty close. Pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. They're pretty close. I said, you know what I told him? And this is what I wanted to do. The thing I find with the squints glasses now is so... I believe I've tracked down the original frame of what it is. So, not a Ray Ban? No, it's not. Okay. So I think it is military issue, GI issue, uh, Vietnam era yeah. frames. Okay. Um, and I think because I was so young, and this is a frame that's made for an adult, it gives this oversized look on me. And so why I've had yeah, such a you, hard time. Exactly. Because you had a small head. So finding this kids. frame. Is they're actually not big. Is they're actually not big. No, yeah, for they sure. Fit they're me not. now and they Frames look, back then were not big. Yeah. Yeah. But as a kid, they yeah. look a little oversized. Yeah. So what I wanted to do was I said, let's oversize them a little bit from the original so that when people put them on, it has that bigger, nerdy type Correct. of feel to that it. That makes sense, actually. So that it's it looks thinking. like Squince's glass. Yeah. And then let's dress them up and make them out of nice acetate and get them done really well so they feel high end. Yep. And then he came up with this magnet idea and um I just want to look him up real quick, but we can yeah. I just want to see that frame. Um, the magnet. And so we came up with the magnet idea, and I think it's amazing. I love the idea of it. But as I was wearing them with the sample, I felt like they were a little unbalanced and a little uh, heavy in the front. And I was thinking that they're just, as a novelty, they're amazing, but I want this to be something that people can wear they have on the a, daily. They have hardware on the side, though. These don't, right? You didn't do that. I mean, no. there's some kind of like crown thing on the side. I remember we used to sell vintage glasses. We used to say military issue. There, there were these like g glasses that they gave to inmates. Do you know if these were made out of nylon? No, no, they weren't. The, I do know you know what I'm frames, talking about? Of course, yes. but those are very frame. similar to the shape. Very similar shape too. Yes. So I went to a uh, who's the guy? Because you know why they little... were. Given because you yeah, can't so stab, you can't stab yeah, anybody yeah, with them. Sure. Yeah, yeah, of course. I actually learned this from a, a guy that I bought a pair of glasses off of that are pretty close to the squints glasses. I wore them in the Logic video when I played Logic I in the video. That. Well, not the part about the glasses, but I read but, that you yeah. Read that. Um, so there's a guy in Silver Lake that has a has a vintage glasses store. It's on called, the side street. Yeah, on the side street. Gen gen uh, uh, gentleman's breakfast. Yes, you yes. still there? I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah, I, I haven't been I, over I, there in a while, I, I, but I really like them. Great guy. Really cool. A really cool store. And so through him, I went there and he, we were trying to break down what it was because I was looking for that frame. Right. And through his knowledge of vintage wear, we kind of got into that area where we're like, you know, what is this? Yeah. What frame is it? And he was telling me about the prison frames right. as well. Right. And he said, it's more of that shape, but I feel like it's almost GI issue. Like it's a harder thing. It looks relatively anonymous actually. Yeah. Uh, that frame. But yeah, yeah. This, this does resemble And I think that thicker. they blacked out some of the, I think there was actually like a oh, little pins silver. or something. Yeah. I think they blacked it out on the front too and changed them a little bit. Sure. Um, on the original, like I said, I haven't seen them in person in years, so I, I don't really know. Right. Um, you know, you never know that this is going to be a thing and you sure. wish you had those. But uh, I guess the property master from the film still owns them. But so on this project, I decided to oversize a little bit. And then now we've gone away from the magnetic frame. Um, so, so not going to do a clip. It's not going to have a clip. So you'll make it maybe just optical and sun. They're going to be optical. They're going to have transition lenses, and they're going to come like that. So I wanted something that obviously inside you could wear and outside turned into sunglasses. Sure. And I like the frame shape on me as a uh, as a sunglass because I put them on, and then I pop these lenses out and put the sunglass right. frames in them. And sure. I said, 
yo, these are dope. Right. Like Wayfarers don't fit me well because of the concave of them. I right. don't like the way they sit on me, but these were like, no, oh, they fit like, you really well. Yeah. These are dope. Yeah. Spencer put them on. They look dope. Uh, the guy who made them in Italy put them on in his first samples. I was like, that's a dope frame. I want these to be wearable, not mm -hmm. just a collection piece. Sure. So we obviously have some like so, uh, some really dope, uh, you know, art for the box idea. Yep. We have a really cool uh, presentation that's going to go along as this collectible piece as we drop, you know, maybe a hundred pieces at a time. Yep. But I wanted what them color? to be wearable. Just the black, or are you going to do tortoise clears? We'll see where we go from there. Yes. Sure. I wanted to start with something that is standard, yeah. and that's why with the clips, things were getting a little. You know, obviously we we're going to do different color clips and different color ways and things. And I said, let's, let's slow down. Sure. Let's make these as nice and high end as possible. Right. Let's release a limited amount and see what the draw is. Sure. And then let's go from there and, and see how it develops. Distribution wise, you're using like your community, his community, d direct to consumer. At yeah, first. we're going to do direct to consumer. We'll do a couple of pop ups, probably one in New York and one in LA. Okay. Um, I have a store, a retail store for cannabis that's going to be opening up. Okay. They'll know. obviously be available there. That's in, in LA? the valley. In the um, valley. Okay. Yeah. It's on Mason and Roscoe. Um, so that'll be open soon here in July. Uh, I think the glasses will be done in August. And so we'll be putting that together. Hopefully we'll line up with like baseball playoffs and hopefully the Dodgers will be going deep and right. <laughs> yeah, winning the world series that and too. everything will kind of time into the, to the flow of that. That's you know? right. Yeah. That would be great. And I would love to enter the space obviously and have something that, you know, stays, you know, I think we can make quality frames. I think that I have a reason to be there obviously as this, this persona in that realm. And, uh, and I would like to have some, you know, as long as it doesn't get goofy and it stays of quality and we get to do some cool stuff, then I'm, I'm all for it. When are you guys going live? Do you know yet? Um, Still working on the I'm packaging? I'm September. Packaging, that, yeah, you yeah, just Packaging's said that, done. We're waiting for the first order to come through and hopefully okay. everything is, is well and we're, we're happy with that. I think we will be. And then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll probably do the first hundred pieces in September sometime. Okay. And, uh, and be ready to go with that. We'll save one for me. I got you 100%. Yeah. <laughs> I'll trade you for that uh that uh no case worries. that you love over there. We appreciate you uh giving us a space in the in of course. the in I mean, the space the to, platform to, to, to share. Yeah, yeah, I mean I'm I'm I think a lot of my audience listens uh is our eyewear connoisseurs or yeah. buyers or things like that. So I uh, appreciate you reaching out and Yeah, and hopefully we you know through Spencer's friends in New York and distribution channels we can put these in cool boutique stores yep. a couple pieces at a time and yep. just have them sit on a shelf, if you know, hopefully, I want them to be not just a novelty, but even if they are, it's still for collectors is going to be a very cool piece. Is it S Town times Qu Squints or what is? It? Yeah, so it's Squints, uh, Squints times Stone. Sto and Wait, that's stone how you say it, Stone. Stone, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and uh, and uh, but it's spelled S T O W W N. Yeah. Right. Uh huh. And um, and so it's kind of like a collaboration between our two brands. How'd you mean? We're him? calling them the L Sevens. Okay. Why? Uh, you know, the L7 weenie thing. L7 weenie, that's yeah, right. You yeah, you know, so yeah. we, we figure we'll call them the L7s. And I like It's that. kind of a square thing. Yeah, and yeah. It, it's dope. You know, we've been that. planning it for years on the side. And uh, yeah, it's kind of a, a cool play on the the lineage of the Squints, yeah. the Squints brand. I'm glad you were serendipitously or whatever, fortuitously given the, the Squints role. Yeah, he has a great role too, actually. Uh, uh, great role. But I think... The whole Wendy Peppercorn, yeah, just the, the classic. It's just it, like it, it like it, like it, it, Squints really was was the guy, yeah, and Ham, those two, yeah. And I mean, I think a lot of Squints is just people ask me that a lot. Is this like, is this character a character that you got to play, or is this just you playing this character? Good question. And you know, and I like to think in acting that you know we see that you know movie stars tend to play the same characters over and over again. Yep. And a lot of that personality is typically just them sure. being that person. That's probably like 90% of people that act. Yeah. Or maybe more. Probably more. Yeah. Because you're, you're, the opposite is like a character actor who really like, right? There's only so many Daniel day Lewis. Correct. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah, or Jim Carrey or the craft. whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for the most part, Jason Statham sure. is Jason Statham. Correct. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> In a different setting. And I love him. And I, I love, love him. Death, I love the good films. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, hopefully I can grow into his position at some point. As <laughs> you kind of like, yeah, yeah, I get yeah, that a lot. Get, yeah, there you go. So, uh, no, I love it. But I, I like that too. I like that, you know, maybe this is just me playing a character and that a lot of, a lot of squints is a lot of, of my own personality, you know? Can I, I, I wanted to ask, like, I didn't ask you how, um, 
how acting or like how did you get into like how did you successfully land roles? Like, is it your family like made you do it or like you got lucky and knew somebody? Just chance, bro. I was in Texas. I was a little kid with long hair okay. and cowboy boots. And my uh, my aunt took my girl cousin, Melissa, that's a little bit older than me, to a talent agent. And she was doing pageants and stuff. Okay. And she took her to this talent agency. And she was just babysitting me at the time. So I was just tagging along. And I had a lot of energy and was super bright and sharp as a kid. And uh, I was about four or five years old at this time. And so she took me with her to this agency, Kim Dawson, and I was just running around the office making people crack up. And they were like, fuck, we need this. We need to send this kid out. We Got think it. he'd be great at this, you know? You're so, like five at the time? Yeah, four or five. Yeah. Okay. So you just had a big personality. Huge personality. Yeah. yeah. And um, and they were like, so they bugged my mom for a while. And she was a dry, she worked at a dry cleaner. My dad was a contractor. He was a carpenter. And uh they didn't have a lot of time to really Take be dragging a kid around. Yeah. You know, in Texas, you don't really think about that type of stuff, especially in 85 or whenever this was, you know? So uh, they bugged her and they eventually took me on an audition for this uh, this Hasbro toy commercial. And it was like some sandwich factory maker, but the production of the commercial was like, was a really big national commercial. And the production of it was like, it was super cool. It was like a, this fucking animated kitchen and all of these things were like mechanical and actually happening and with this sandwich factory thing. And so my first audition I booked and uh, it was a big national commercial. And after that, I booked some film, some like little southern regional film. And I would pretty much just, so you, I would book anything. You were, yeah, out. you were hitting at a high rate. You yeah. just, you'd, you'd, you'd audition and book. Yeah, everything pretty much. Wow. Like instantly almost, you know what I mean? And uh you weren't shy at all. No. You were given, you can't read. So they just, it's short line, like not a lot of lines. I have a crazy memory. A crazy So they're telling you what to memory. say. Yeah. And I can just, and you're just nailing it at yeah, this just age. Just repeat it back. Yeah. yeah. And um, we end up in LA because we met an agent in Dallas through some something. And it was a very big child's agency out here called Mary Grady. Um, she was a wonderful woman that she's passed away now, but she uh, ran a huge. Uh, children's talent agency in Los Angeles. And uh, she was like, come out for a summer or come out for a pilot season or something and let's just see what happens, you know? And so, you know, my mom and dad split up and uh, she decided to take me across the country to LA and we kind of landed and never. started working and never left. Wow. And you just continued to book. Yeah. Uh, what before was the first? Sandlot, I yeah. did Father of the Father Bride. Bride yep. And uh, a bunch of commercials and and like you know regional, I mean TV little shows, TV and shows and guest the, stars. Yeah. I was on LA Law, had a reoccurring yeah. role on that. Okay, so I was just, you know, not like crazy sitcom status, sure. but I was booking a lot of good projects yeah. and a very wide range of comedy, drama, commercials, this and that, kind of doing it all. So. I just continued to work. Then Sandlot, and then you know, we you've done contract stuff with Disney, yeah, well, and uh, ended up on Freaks and Freaks Geeks and with all the legends. And uh, that was a big show, huge, bro. It was such a cool thing. Were to you do. a regular on that show? I didn't watch it, but I know I it's recurring. A, I know it's like um, a cult. Like, I did like of... four or five episodes of okay. ten, so okay. I guess I'm almost a regular. Sure. You know, yeah. And uh, that was a lot of fun because obviously there's so much talent there, and it's Judd Apatow's first show, That's and. Right. Uh, and uh, just all of the directors and writers and Paul Feig and, and, yep. and Victor Sue and all these guys that produce this show is like, it's comedy royalty, bro. It's For the, sure. the heavy hitters of everything that came after that was, no you know, on there, you know? And it was a cool set to be on to just see all of these great, these great minds just kind of creating art, you know, for this short period of time. So yeah, I've got to do a lot of really cool, fun stuff. Um you know, you never know. You're just a natural. So just the answer is, I mean, you just, we just heard the story, but you're just kind of a natural at it. Like you didn't have to try that hard. Yeah. You just were a big character. They give you the lines and you just would nail it. Would you? I yeah. Mean, I mean, kinda, I did, I did training and stuff. I'm and sure. I did the whole tour of but that it, it, as being part of the business. But it came naturally to you. It came natural to me. Yeah. Yes. And at some point I started to think about it and I was like, man, I don't, I don't even know if I like doing this. And it's kind of like. You know, it just comes naturally to me. It's easy. I still book stuff. Yeah. Maybe this isn't the business for me. But you're a creative. Do you, are there other parts of the industry that you think now that you're a 40 something year old man that like you like more like writing, directing? Because you've probably done a little bit of everything, right? Like you've written some um, stuff or. I haven't written anything. Uh, okay. You know, I'm a Gemini. I feel like yeah. I'm a good orator and, you know, Gemini's roll the pen. So I'm sure if I sat down and 
focused in that area, I would be decent at it. ADD Gemini who can't yeah. sit down and write a, a script. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an ADD Aries who can't sit down and write anything either. But yeah, um, you know what it is. It's like uh, if I sat there and I, I, I guess if I have the time to tell a story, then then yeah, I could see myself in that role. And right. I think it's probably more fitting than being in front of the camera for me as well. Um, I haven't got to that that point in my life, but definitely I see myself in the production side of entertainment at some point for sure in, in some capacity. Have you ever thought, and I guess I think I just asked this as a fan of comedy, have you ever thought about like stand-up or comedy or anything like that, or is that not you? I don't know. Uh, you know, it's a pretty tough job. It's totally different. I mean, yeah, it is no, just Yeah, no, it would totally be different. fun. But there is um, cross, some, a lot, many have crossed yeah, over. Yeah, I like... Uh, I like structured sitcom comedy and things yeah. of that nature. Um, that obviously comes easy to me. I, you know, I've never been, I don't know, I've never tried, so who knows? Yeah. I mean, it, it might have been a calling I missed. <laughs> I, I, I can talk I can talk shit with the best of them, yeah. so I guess uh, yeah. it wouldn't be a bad thing, but uh, it, it just wasn't something that I got into. You certainly have the acting chops for it. There's a lot of acting with I it, but writing too. I appreciate the craft of it. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a very uh, amazing, amazing, one of the... I guess it's one of the best ways to connect with people, right? I think so, yeah. I mean, because you're always bringing up real life topics. What else? Where do we go from here? I did just do a small role in a film. Um, Burner from Cookies, uh, the rapper and the cannabis cookies entrepreneur. Is cannabis, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, he uh, produced a film. It's kind of like a, a gangster flick from San Francisco that's about these guys that are bipping cars that are uh, breaking into the cars and stealing stuff. So. Okay. He did a really cool film in Frisco and gave me a dope part in it and uh, uh, just a little cameo. Where, He's gonna do a uh, where can films. we see it? It'll be it's coming out on uh, November 11th. Okay, um, I'm not sure exactly what what distribution chains is getting dropped through yet, but okay. uh, it'll be posted on socials from all of us. And, Have you uh, seen it? Or are they still editing? And stuff I like haven't it? seen it yet. Still um, editing. The trailer just dropped, but he's got a, a young cast of characters in it that are amazing, and it's very authentic. Okay. And he shot it in the streets of San Francisco, which okay. is an incredibly difficult place to shoot a film, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I would just, imagine. Yeah, it's nothing, chaotic. It's chaotic. It's yeah. not a lot to be able to lock down. You know, yeah. everything, you can't park, a lot of hills. So. But like he did it, it's a full length feature? Full length feature. And like did it like legit, like like tried to get permits in San Francisco? Oh, everything. Like, right, yeah, yeah, yeah okay, To yeah, the yeah. point. So, yeah, SAG, so Self-funded, the whole thing, yeah. With the city of San Francisco. So that's what you're saying is chaotic to do because there's oh, just yeah, nowhere bro. to pick because you can't shut down. It's no, small, can't. it's tiny in San Francisco, but it's dense. It's densely populated. Right. And you're like trying to, you know, break into cars and do all this stuff right. and lock down streets and having base camp be out here on an island and over here and travel around. So it was a, it was cool to see them in work producing this film and uh, the, you know, the production company that produced it. Uh, I'm excited to see. I'm a big fan and this isn't, I don't know who's listening. Maybe some people that work with me wouldn't like it, but I'm a big fan of chaotic work environment environments when you're trying to create something special. Yeah. Not to like a fault, like where it's toxic, but like I think creativity is spawned oftentimes from, you know, a group of chaotic, passionate people. Yeah. And some of my favorite creations over the past fifteen years in this brand have been when there's been a lot of chaos. So um that recipe resonates with me for whatever it's worth. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm I'm in this you know, obviously I'm in the cannabis space and it's a very chaotic space altogether, constantly moving and changing. Um but I feel the same way. I like a little bit of turmoil. I right. wanna feel a little bit of ruffled feathers. And I like, I like, you know, shoot or shoot, bro. I like to see people that are out there swinging for the fences every Absolutely. day and taking shots. I and love that. I totally agree. Hats off to Bernard. I'm not afraid for, to miss. You can't be afraid to miss. This dude takes big You're shots, gonna miss. bro. Yeah. And he, some of them work out and some of them don't. That's but the you it. see that that's, that's the way to greatness, you know? And right. for somebody to take on a, a personal passion project to shoot a major motion picture in the streets of San Francisco to tell a story about a city sure. that's never been shown in that light, actually. You know, but there's no, like... There's no like crime dramas based around San Francisco, really. I'm sure, yeah. So it's like a, and it's such a, you know, a pillar in the underworld community since the 1800s to the gold rush and everything else. It has such a rich, rich history. Uh, it's cool to see somebody telling telling their story, and for him to do it with his own with his own financing and like really put his money into making cool shit. I like yeah. people that say, "Damn, there's nothing cool around right now. I'm gonna spend my money and make something cool." Yeah, and then figure out how to sell it. That's an interesting point. Like, how could that be true that San Francisco has never had a crime movie? It certainly has had decades of crime. 
Yeah. Nobody's ever done a movie set there. I mean, there's a couple of like, the only thing I could think of is like flicks. Paul Newman, like that scene. Isn't like the car the chase bullet scene? Bullet yeah. scene? Yeah, there's. Isn't I mean, they s- use the streets for things. Sure, but there's not, not like, like nothing really telling based about on the, the city. San Francisco environment. Yeah, right? yeah, or about these characters and this That's lifestyle. Right. So That's right. It's you know, it's we know with streaming things have been a little dry. Yeah. So there's a lot of content. I find myself flipping through it more than actually focusing yeah, on something. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, it's a cool time. And I think that they, uh, I read the script. I was pleasantly surprised. Yeah. I thought it was a great script. I thought it was a really good opportunity for these young kids to right. shine and build a career for themselves off of it. And then seeing the idea of what it was going to look like and then seeing on set how it was being filmed and right. the pace of it, I said, wow, this is going to be this is going to be special. This is going to be something that is, I love that. I love when like anybody I show the trailer to is like, that gave me anxiety. It's kind of like, yeah, uncut yeah, gems. yeah I want like you to fan. feel like it's, it's, it's this is what it feels like right. to, to, yeah. to be in that, in that element. You know what I mean? I mean, San Francisco is no joke. Oakland. I mean, it's not, you know, you talked about Reseda and like the nineties. I mean, it was, I know some, some, Heavy shit from San Francisco. Those people are, you yeah, know, the real deal. It still sure. is. Yeah, I mean, it's Oak- the, it's it. Honestly, it still is. Oakland is is is. It's a free for all right now, bro. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, it's chaotic. Yeah, they're in the streets now doing the side shows with real. fucking AK forty sevens out of the car and shit. They have the their own don't language. Show up. Yep. And the Bay has always had its own lingo, its own thing. Hundred percent. It probably created a lot of the the motion in rap and popular culture Absolutely. and never gets the credit for it. So 100%. they got a big chip on their shoulder. There is a Mac Dre documentary that I've seen that's really good and a few other things that I've seen about yeah. car culture there and things of that nature, but it somehow continues. It flies under the radar. Unless you're like from here and you've been there and you've seen some of those things. You have to go find it. The and masses it, don't get it. They, they really don't. And, no. and, and San Francisco is so aesthetically beautiful. Like if you drive into it and you see the bridges and the so bay, beautiful. you – you know, you don't go down market at night. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Or you don't fuck with Oakland. Like, you cannot see that stuff quite easily. But it really is kind of the majority of San Francisco. But it's this weird dichotomy. <laughs> it it's is. this weird dichotomy because I know a lot of tourists that come from Europe are like, oh, we're going to shoot up, drive through Big Sur and go see San Francisco. And they're like, it's so beautiful. And it's like, right. But you didn't really, like, fuck with it. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I went there so much because I went to school on the Central Coast and we just go up there and, like, yeah, my eyes got open to some shit. I've seen some shit there yeah. on a- just on accident, you know. Yeah. Like, and I mean, uh, if you stay on the streets, you're gonna see some crazy shit. It's for a sure. wild city, for sure. And it's not like L.A. where it, it just spreads. Yeah. You know, I think L.A. has gotten a little now where you're like uh, it's just actually sprawling. It. Yeah. You used to have to go to an area to see that. Like, right. Skid Row is obviously spread out right. at this point. Yep. But you can't miss it in San Francisco. No, you really cannot. You got five square miles, bro. You're yeah, in exactly. The shit. Yeah. You're going to be walking out of a 30 million brownstones, stepping over somebody shooting up or right. something, and it's just right. part of the game. Right. Everybody has to share space. That's there right. is no space. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing this film, then. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely look for it. Speaking of stealing cars, someone told me the other day, have you seen these Kia, bo- you know what Kia Boys yeah. is? Yeah. I don't know. I, just read I don't that. know I read, much about it. I don't know much I about it either. I read a little bit. Yeah. It's funny. That shit's crazy. I read, we read, My wife and I just bought a minivan. It's a fucking Kia, but this shit's <laughs> taking place in Chicago, so I don't think. Uh, uh, you never know. The, but it's really crazy, crazy, but they can like steal the, it's so off topic here but they can just steal the car with like a usb and like a, it takes like th- 21 seconds or something everything is fucking uh, insane dude uh, they make so devices now that more. yeah that you can buy on amazon yeah um that can basically steal any type of electric pattern yeah. or code yeah so if you want to get into a gate or sure you want to get somebody's credit card information or hack into their phone or start their fucking car we're so with a little dude. receiver thing <laughs> you know yeah. what i mean yeah you think you have cameras, but these things can black them out. That's like right. there's just technology is, is is always the means to control us, but at the same time set us free, right? Like right. there's there's well, once there's a signal, that's a two way street. That's right. <laughs> Anything you build can be unbuilt. That's right. Or backdoored. So right. that's kind of where we're at. And you, you can know? just Google how to do that. It doesn't take much time. They got TikToks now and that just show you how to do that stuff. Yeah, and there's a lot of turmoil and there's a lot of uh we've seen the tension and yeah. the general public feeling. Sure. And the kids are unappreciated we feel like yep. and they're wicked fucking smart because they we used to have to like used to have to get taught this shit now yeah. they can teach themselves from like four years old on youtube that's right how to do anything so that's these right. guys are operating on a different playing field you know and uh we see the it's it's uh 
maybe GTA was a bad fucking game. Huh? <laughs> I love that game. I love it but too. I think so, but but yeah. when you look around, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. thinking like, uh, maybe this wasn't the right course of things to, <laughs> maybe for not. all the kids to be running around playing. Huh? Maybe <laughs> not. Things seem a little, by the, a little chaos. By the know? way, has Squints ever stolen a car? Um, <laughs> no, no GTA in my- <laughs> No, in my, no real no, life GTA? No, that wasn't my, you didn't, my thing. You didn't we race cars and we're There's a different huge... street racing scene and that type of stuff. I live in Thousand Oaks now. We moved from Venice like four years ago. And dude, when How's I'm the right? difference from TO to from Venice to TO? Quite a Oh, shock, it's a huh? huge difference. But like- Good for the family though. Good for the family. Yeah. But- I'll drive. Sometimes I'll work late and drive through. You know, the you know on the one hundred and one through yeah. Rec- through like not Reseda because Reseda is more inland, but through the valley. Yeah, and there's still racing cars there. Like mm-hmm. after ten o'clock, there's that whole like like oh, yeah. one hundred and one street culture, uh, yeah. car culture, racing. That's always been a huge part of the valley. Yeah, and I know that people would gather and do this fucking donuts in the. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a big deal yeah, out it's there. It's getting crazy with all the street takeovers and stuff. Uh, you know. Hey man, you uh, you know through public policy, yeah, and uh, you know a, a a discontent for enforcement of law. Yeah, for sure, you get chaos in the streets, and it's uh, been that way, though. it has to a it's certain regard. Worse. It's got worse. There's just yeah, you know, people used to get picked up and actually do time over shit, right? And it leveled a playing field, and sure. now it's kind of a free for all. And we've yeah. seen what that's done to a lot of these inner cities, you know? Yeah. Where you can you can have big sprawling areas where chaos can kind of reign, you know? Yeah. But growing up in Venice or growing up in LA, it's I mean like You've I've always seen it all. I've I've seen it all already. Yeah. Like it's not it's not like uh alarming to me. It's it's just a new generation. It's just a little you know different. What? But in our time we had to uh communication wasn't the same. Right. And then coordination wasn't what it is. That's now. right. So now you can drop a TikTok, correct, to coordinate get to people a thing to gather in Huntington Beach. That's right, and you got chaos in the streets immediately because somebody had a following or it spread to a certain thing. So, so now it was word got, of mouth back then. Yeah, it was word of mouth. You had yeah, flyer parties and stuff. Yeah. These kids are operating on a different on a different dialogue. Much quicker, you know. They yeah. they can uh, and organize. They can organize yeah. and plan and and do different stuff, which That's right. is, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, you always see yourself in LA. Like this is you're, you're a big Angelino, you, and you're bro. still in the Valley. You've been in the Valley. Yeah, I love the Valley. I love LA. I love my city. Uh, it's getting hard to rationalize raising a family here anymore. Sure. To be honest, you got five. I seen I seen a guy yesterday. I posted about it on Twitter just because I was driving down Sepulveda, and there's a dude just sitting there, butt ass naked on a bucket on the side of the street, bro, dick out, just like oh my god. Just in sitting on a bucket yeah. on Sepulveda and Sherman Way, bro, on Ugh. the side of the street. People walking by And you by got your, like, eight-year-old, six-year-old in the car. They weren't in the car with But me. they could have been. But this is the thing that, like, there is no transition from crossover now. Right. Now you have to worry about your kids getting hit in the head in the rock with a rock from some fucking random. Right. It's not the same level of chaos anymore. Sure. It's like, you know, what are we paying so much to live in a place that obviously is working against us sure. as upstanding citizens upstanding citizens, yeah. so to speak, or whatever you want to call it. Not to, you know, it's not about who or or they or here or now or sure. what or or levels, but it's like, it's almost like it works against you. Yeah, It's it's hard to build here. It's hard to run businesses here. There's not really many upsides of it outside of the Tax, attachment the to thing. this place. Yeah, something that it's so, it's, it's, you can make it tangible if you spent time, but there's something I love about Southern California, about Los Angeles. I'm a huge, I, you know, but everything you just said is so fucking true. And I, and I will say that, like, we have no sense of community. You know why? Because they make it difficult to build community. Yeah, you know, you have to go completely out of your way to build your own community. Who can eat? two years of rent to try to open a coffee shop or like any of these restaurants that just open and go under, you yeah, know, 100%. spend a million dollars building a restaurant. You know how many plates you have to fucking sell to get a right. million dollars back? Right. Or never. Right. You know, even if it stays open for the next 15 years, which the, the you know, that that's not. Yeah. Th- and everything is too hard. And it's easy to build stuff People in aren't eating out anymore. And these, they, these little communities, they they allow businesses to thrive. Right. And and through that, you build community. Right. You build spaces where people want to come and open a bookstore and open right. a coffee shop and open these things and and take care of the community and and have nice nice greenery and create a walkable like livable right. space. And right now we see, you know, boarded up buildings and and uh, chaos and yeah. people sleeping outside of them. It's just kind of a I have to Unfortunately, believe. it's a it's 
it's not looking good. You there know? are other states that don't have as much of that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was going to say that I will say the one thing that I have seen an inc increase of just that I don't recall from 10 or 20, 30 years ago is like things that have happened to friends when they really weren't putting themselves in a bad situation. Exactly. Like it just like they went to Whole Foods and then they're, they were getting in their car and their car got stolen yeah. on just like a Wednesday during the day. Like I don't recall that. Like a lot of bad things that happened to my friends was like, we shouldn't have been doing that. You yeah. know, what were you doing there? Um, he wasn't so I, at Echo Park trying to buy dope from some dude or something. Right, or like, like you went and got a, I, I, we used to go to MacArthur Park to get our fake ID, yeah. right? And it's yeah. like, nothing exactly. ever happened to me, but like I heard a couple of things. It's of like, yeah, you're in fucking MacArthur, MacArthur Park, Park in 1996, Which, dude. It's like zombie land now. Right, but now, like I've had like a girl that worked for me, she literally, like that's a true story. She was just coming out of Whole Foods and then she opened her car and then somebody just took it. I know people that went That shit didn't happen that, as much when I was a kid. No, I yeah. know girls that, uh, a friend of mine uh, was telling me a story about a girl he was he was seeing and and she has a like a, a spa downtown and like some fucking dude just hit her in the head with a rock. Right. Fucked her up, bro. Right. She was in the fucking hospital. Yeah, random acts of violence. Super random. Like that's what happen. I'm saying. Yeah, if that I know didn't that as much I don't as go over here and I don't enter myself sure. into that element, I should be okay. Right. And I felt safe in LA. And right. obviously I'm a very fortunate person. I don't see a lot of that stuff. My eyes are open. I've right. been around enough to know my environment and what's going on. But like I don't want to have to worry about my wife. Or my kids, or right. people that aren't so versed in understanding the urban environment. For sure, they don't come like, from here. They don't, you know, they shouldn't have to worry about that. Right. It shouldn't have to be like just chaos in the streets or seeing some guy that's just randomly walking up and punching women. Or sitting on a bucket naked in the middle of the day. Just, yeah. Just why? Uh, you know? Well, with all that said, anybody listening, if you're thinking about coming to LA, don't come here, right? <laughs> just don't come here. We don't, it's not good here. Stay away. <laughs> Please, uh, I hope we've sold you on the idea that you should not come here. You, come be a come. tourist, spend your money here. Yeah. Don't move here. You're going to come here anyway. <laughs> I and know. if you're chasing a dream, it's still one of the best the places on earth. But. Absolutely. But uh, we have options now yeah. because technology moves different and right. uh, you can find a digital platform to do things elsewhere. So yeah, yeah, man, having a property somewhere with a little bit of land where I have some peace of mind. That's I think right. the, the, I think I'm getting drowned out in the chaos at this point and I need a little bit of peace and serenity to continue to grow. I might, yeah. I might be reaching that, that point in my life. You okay. Know? Well, hopefully this project brings you a little bit of joy in terms of, you know, uh, I don't know, a, a track towards it's doing something you're space. passionate about. No, but I mean, creating yeah. something you're passionate about, seeing it flourish, bringing people into your community. Those are all the things that kind of like, it's its own form of like peace and serenity. Uh, creation is my favorite. That's right. Nothing... Even in the cannabis space, nothing uh, bringing something to life from a thought is like the only thing that fuels me in life. Right. It's not monetary driven. Right. Right. Yeah. The money's cool. Yeah. I mean, money's the result of good work. This is what you get rewarded for doing yeah, something but good. It's not what I'm after. I'm no. not thinking, oh, this is going to make a bunch of money. No. But having an organic thought and then pulling it out of here and bringing it into the physical right. is like, I get excited about that. Sure. That shit makes me want to hop up out of bed every day and keep creating. It, right. it makes me feel like, yo, this is what it's about. It's about bringing things into life and collaborating with cool people and uh, actually seeing an idea through, having the thought and then seeing it and then seeing the reception of it. Bring in the joy to other people, yeah. Is, is amazing. Yep. And that's what fuels me to keep, to keep going, you know? Yeah, same, absolutely. Um, well, that's a more positive note to end on, I think, unless you have any specific questions for me um, about eyewear. I mean, how is the space? How do you like it? What's uh? Yeah, um, tell, it's, tell me a little. Yeah, bit I'll about tell you your, a little bit. My perspective, uh, my perspective on eyewear and your experience in the in the business. Yeah, I mean, so obviously, I think you know, I was born in the industry. My father started all over people's. I, you know, initially great brand, by the way. Thank you. I've been, I've, I've loved, I've loved that um, those frames since I was. Younger than I could afford to wear them, probably. Uh, I mean, the biggest brand of the 90s, for sure. And if uh -huh. you were in LA at the time, yeah, working in Hollywood, in any capacity, popular, like yeah. everybody talked and about And I love it. those frames. Yeah, directors high. used to go in there. And they did when I opened my store in Venice in 2009, too. And just like, they'd be working on a set and they'd be like, the, the styling was bad for glass. And they'd be like, I don't, just, they'd send a stylist to the store and just be like, just buy fucking 20 pairs of all over people's, come back to set, we'll figure it out, right? So like, yeah. super iconic household name in, in this city. Um I didn't plan on getting into eyewear, uh, but went to work for my dad. And he had sold his company to Oakley, and like I just fell in love with that entrepreneurial spirit idea. I wanted to create my own community, um, so I, I kind of knew at the time coming in it was like post recession two thousand eight. 
um, that there was this opportunity to create like a youthful brand to kind of pick up where all the people's left off because they went a little corporate. Yeah. Um, and at that time, people were real hungry, I would say, for uh, newness. And there was a lot of it. And a lot of brands spawned um, in that era, like 2009 to 2015. Um, but the ones that really withheld this test of time are the ones that kind of, I mean, like I think like ours, where you created this like very specific identity and had like a very – um, engaged community for us. It was Venice beach on Abbott Kinney in 2009 through 15, you know, real people. Yeah. For, I mean, I was there, you know, early two thousands, but, but that was, but that, that was like, my, yeah. Everybody that's there now is there because of that. Era. At, I mean, at the time it was very like now. Yeah. I mean, now there's like Adidas on the street and stuff and it's not yeah. now. It's but at not. the time it was like, I remember Abbott Kenny going to auditions when I was a kid. Right. So I remember the evolution of Venice again and right. when it became a creative space for artists. Right. And what brought all of the money there that you see now. And right. like, you know, a sponsor where these guys will tell you as it got. Yeah. You know, gentrified. Uh, gentrified yeah, yeah. Of course. It for changed lack of a lot. A better word. You yeah. Know? Uh, yeah. No, that's what it is, though. Um, so anyways, we, you know, we built this great brand. I think for us, it was a very, you know, a very welcoming space, not to speak to, I mean, you know, obviously the son of all our peoples is certainly starting on first or second base, but definitely executed a great brand, great quality, great style, something, you know, price wise that the market needed and people were really receptive to it. Um, post recession too, which maybe speaks to now, like creating something at a little lower price point. We were made in China, which is different. I kind of trying to change that a little bit now, but at that time, um, you know, having an iPhone, I didn't really care personally. I was like, you know, good product. I'll, you know, I'll use it. I think so, that China gets a bad rap in that regard. I mean, and they can make great the quality. fashion world is like, yeah, China is like a step up than a lot of the other Absolutely. producers. They do good work. And they can do it at scale. And if you work with the right factories, they're ethical and they, you know, they know what they're doing. Uh, but we also have a second brand now that we make in Japan and we're, you know, testing Italy a little bit, but in any case, makes great eyewear too, for sure. Um, but they have capacity issues. Like there's a very popular brand right now. Who's like trying to like buy up factories to not only help him meet capacity, but also hurt anybody else trying to like keep up really? with him. Well, yeah, it's a very smart strategy. I mean, I've heard that through the grapevine. Um, and I didn't think of it, but I wish I had like, it's smart, <laughs> you know, like that's a very smart approach. Yeah. Um, there's still going to be plenty of factories there that will be able to help other people. But like, like you can't scale if you make in Japan. It's very challenging unless you just scale up your pricing. They're very boutique at at doing yeah. high end work. That's right. They create great works of art, but right. we know that they have a declining population. That's right. They have a very old population. That's right. They have a young population that is moving away from the towns and moving to the cities yep. and trying so they to don't do don't want to work things. in factories, making things. That, yeah, crap. It's they're a, not. Yeah. I've been looking at property over in Japan actually, just because. Right. There's a lot available, and I love the culture and the idea of it, and uh, and uh, it's sad to watch it. It's kind of, it's. I see that through the property value that things are kind of falling apart. Right? Yep, I would think so. Yeah. Um. So, just general thoughts on the space, and from when I entered it and where it is now, is that at the time that I entered, it was still very much like you know. You know, there was not e-commerce and there wasn't digital marketing, so it was kind of word of mouth, and you had to have great product. And um, you had to build a community of sales reps and, direct, and sales directors and distributors and, you know, get to know your accounts and have them spread the message. Um, now, if I think about it, it's just so heavily digital now. Like, yeah. I cannot open my phone without get, – I, I actually wanted to. I just don't have the time. I wanted to start writing a list of every time I saw a new brand marketing a pair of glasses to me. Yeah. I, I, I think if I'm being conservative, it's, it's probably like 15. I, I think honestly I've seen maybe 40. So I, you know, I can't speak to how those brands are doing. I think they come and they go, but there's certainly, and it kind of speaks to what we were saying with just like people's, you know, the economy and people's wallets. I think there's just a lot of like, and I'm not going to say copycats. I'm, I don't mind being copied. They're not, it's not about copying the style. There's just a lot of like medium to low price glasses right now that are spending a lot of money on digital marketing, trying to get the audience's attention. And those people are seeing $900 glasses, Garrett Light at $400 and 70 and like, you know, you're really fighting for the conversation there and it's just changed a lot. So you have to really make sure you have the right team spending the right money and saying the right message and then nurturing the connoisseurs, right? Yeah. Like you can't forget, well, we can't forget who we are, which is just like eyewear connoisseurs who know how to make great style great quality glasses. We understand our design DNA. We continue to try to deliver it. We hope we don't miss too much because sometimes you try things and they don't work. It's tough. Um, yeah. So you have good seasons and bad seasons <clears throat> and then trying to like keep up with the Joneses on like staying in the conversation because you have this revolving audience of 20 somethings that don't maybe know Garrett light. Maybe they don't even know all of her people's. Maybe they do. 
but they're getting their information through targeted ads. Yeah. And it's like, how do you convince them without them having a physical experience in a store? And then how do you grow from there? So it's an exciting challenge. It's just that would be my general perception on like 2009 through 2015 was still kind of my dad's era in terms of like you could have an old school thought or strategy. Yeah. You can't really do that anymore. No, like start like changed. maybe one every five years will be able to penetrate this sort of eyewear market on the wholesale side and the thousands of stores globally that sell eyewear to people who can't see, you know, and or want sunglasses. You know, whereas when I started there was like twenty people coming in and maybe didn't all make it. But you know, it's like most now are like these kind of like direct to consumer. I'm also in America, right? Like I don't know that that's the case if you're in Japan. Like if I yeah. if I was Japanese and I had a you know a Japanese network of social media, whatever, get it? Like I don't know that they're seeing that as much. I don't I don't know how big direct to consumer is in other you know parts of the world, but I know that it's bigger than it was. Yeah, so. I mean it's a great it's it's a the most challenging and the best time to be alive in regards of like reach at this point because. You know, I'm finding out about all of these Chinese and Japanese markets and European markets just for my own personal things. And I'm like, the world is a big place and you can touch everyone now. Eamon John, who was the creator of FUBU, like, you know, FUBU came yeah. and went here, but FUBU is still huge in Korea. Right. And, and it's still doing numbers, a lot of his brands right. in other places. Right. And there's always another place for things. Who are your, uh, who do you look up to in the space that kind of shape, uh, what you want to bring in, into that or, or that is currently operating that you still like their, their direction? You know, I, 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 you could argue that I'm biased or un, unbiased, but I really do think that like, and my dad's not involved with all people, they've done such a fucking good job of like selling out, which is the American dream, going through five or six years of being like, you know, losing a bit of their core customer because it was like, oh, they're Luxottica now. And then somehow like really finding their identity of the like the Hollywood brand. Yeah. And um, Luxottica spending money where a lot of executives maybe would not see value. Things that you can't quantify, whether it's like a sexy CEO. I don't have another way to say it. Not yeah. that he's handsome. I mean, just like he's out in the streets, like yeah. mingling with movie stars uh -huh. and like overpaying a director to do an ad for like a 30 a 20 second YouTube spot or whatever whatever it is like i think that they've done a really good job of you know uh, branding themselves over 40 years now right 1986 yeah. so it's close to 40 years wow <laughs> you know and i think had a lull when they sold but really found their stride so i really it's kind of funny that I'm the son and like, that's like kind of like, I, I hope that we, we have, I think we have a different identity, right? Like I think we come from a different generation, a different message, more youthful Venice beach versus Hollywood, more fly under the radar, more like more the writer sitting, sitting at the coffee shop and less like the actor, you know, in the film. Um, and I hope that we can kind of mimic that. That's certainly one. Um, uh, that's just really the one that stands out. How do you out. feel Lux Exotica does? having a biggest the biggest share of market um in the luxury eyewear community i mean i think they're i, mean, I don't know much about the but company it's itself. probably I just, just know them as a, a as a, a mega juggernaut in the space you know i mean the thing that we learned through the pandemic is that the juggernauts have the ability to spend the money at a time when nobody else does and a huge opportunity to do so correctly and then be miles ahead of you when you realize that that's what you also needed to do. Yeah. Right. So I, I, it's not so much a test. I mean, you, you, look, there's definitely Luxottica haters in my space, but like that you don't get to where they get without having like really talented people and a great strategy um, and they really understand their brands, but there are, they have great competitors now too. Maybe not financially, but like LVMH has built like a yeah. thing called Delios and they've bought eyewear brands and caring group. And, you know, there are other, uh, conglomerates that are like all kind of are seeing the recipe, which Luxottica basically built by buying all of her peoples in the early two thousands and then bringing it to where it is today. Um, and I'm not even like a historian buff. I probably should be. They probably did so with another brand through the seventies and eighties, but I think there was just nothing like all was of Ray Ban their first was Ray Ban their first brand? Or was that an American brand that they, I mean, they purchased? Own Persol as well? too. Oh, Persol I mean they bought amazing. Yeah, they bought all that shit. Um uh I think 
but when they bought all of her peoples, they created like a separate thing called like Atelier, which is where they put brands that are more like lifestyle luxury, like all of her peoples. And then all the other conglomerates kind of followed suit and they all kind of have like these lifestyle luxury that they're buying. So that, because they have a lot of like um, licensing models that don't warrant, like don't yield as much profit. Right. Yeah. So I think they've all kind of figured out like they want a brand um, and um, yeah, I mean, to answer your question, I mean, I, I, I admire what like Exotica does. I think that my customers certainly don't like them and they try not to buy glasses from them if they can't avoid it. They like to support independent brands. Um, but you know, independent brands struggle with giving free shipping or fucking yeah. fast delivery. Like Exotica can do all that stuff. Yeah. So it's a double edged sword. They but, have a burn um, rate that that a, a small company can't can't 100%. mess with. I mean, yeah, they're turning over hundreds of millions of profit, right? Yeah. Like, we're, yeah, we can't do those things. So, um, like I said, I admire them. They're here, they're obviously here to stay. Like, it's unavoidable. So, um, yeah, uh, th that's how I would kind of look at those two things for sure. Well. To wrap up, I think like I just want to say that um, there's nothing more Hollywood than a good pair of shades or a good pair of glasses, Love and that. nothing more can set a tone or pull an athlete together than than or create a personal style right. than a pair of glasses. I definitely feel like Superman when I throw the shades on. Right. I say a squints a lot that like you know, Superman went in the phone booth and, and, and took the glasses off. And I kind of go in the phone booth and put the glasses on to become this character. And, uh, it's, a it's an amazing space and I'm happy to step in and, and, uh, try to offer the world something there. And, uh, and all of my classic, uh, everything I can think of in Hollywood or in classic Americana or globally has something to do with eyewear and the way they wear them, whether it's James Dean and his reading glasses or, or, you know, Paul Newman or, or Steve McQueen and a pair of Basol. And, right. uh, you know, these things are, are timeless and they create a vibe and, and they make a simple t-shirt and jeans, uh, be a star. You totally. Know? I agree with you. Welcome to the show. I wish I could remember the exact Kenny Powers quote, right? Where he says, yeah. like, welcome to the show, motherfucker. Like <laughs> All right, dude. Pleasure. My pleasure. All Thank right. you, girl.